my memory here at UCSD in La Jolla, uh, there nothing but good positive ones. 1963, you know, 50, almost 50 years ago, um, I came here, and uh, I, I must say that for eight, uh, including a postdoc time at the SOP Institute, uh, following graduate study here, uh, we had a really exciting uh, time. And uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to uh, uh, allow me to the opportunity to celebrate this 50s brilliant history of UCSD. Um, this is the title under which I try to uh, give you some uh, outline of uh, the research career I have had since then. And uh, <clears throat> I want to, um, let's say in 1962, um, I was, as uh, Anirvan told you, that I was an uh, undergraduate senior in the chemistry department of the Kyoto University, University of Kyoto. And uh, toward the end of the third uh, the junior year, we had to uh, decide the, uh, in which lab we do the so-called graduation thesis work. And uh, <clears throat> by that time, I was not so sure about the uh, uh, staying in uh, hardcore chemistry. I wanted the uh, chemistry is, of course, very important, interesting field. But uh, I, as, as a younger, you know, 21 years old uh, uh, boy, I thought uh, into the future I wanted to explore something more, let's say, new, newer things. And but I wasn't sure what that would be. So one of the uh, the uh, <coughs> um, students who are above above me, two years older, one day told me there is a new uh, biology is emerging uh, in U.S. in the U.S. and uh, Europe, and that is called molecular biology. Okay. And uh, I knew nothing about it, but uh, this person suggested to me to read a couple of papers by two French molecular biologists whose picture is shown on the left side of this uh, photograph. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Jacob, uh, <coughs> Francois Jacob, and this is Jack Monod. This is the Andre Rouoff, who is also a great scientist, and there he was a kind of a, a mentor of these two people. And Jacob and Monod had just published a paper uh, which is entitled as the operon theory. Okay. What is the operon theory? Operon theory is the first paper, how first theory. It's not just an uh, intellectual theory. It has a theory with some uh, experimental evidence supporting it uh, <coughs> that uh, about the, how the genes, uh, use of the gene or expression of the gene can be regulated in, 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 in the cells. Okay. And uh, so this work was, uh, I, I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but uh, <coughs> these are the genes and uh, th some uh, genes with uh, related biochemical function. These are enzymes, encoding enzymes. Uh, they are uh, clustered in, 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 in the, what is they call the operon. And the expression of this, uh, these DNA genes uh, through the messenger RNA and eventually the protein are regulated by this uh, regulatory element, things like a repressor and the operator. Okay. This is the first time ever that a serious uh, idea was presented and uh, with uh, some uh, pretty good evidence uh, for, for that idea. Okay. And I, when I read this, these papers, I was so impressed. Um, Biology at that time was more, I would say, more pheno phenomenology, more uh, classification of species, some physiology. And uh, this type of uh, uh, study or theory, which really dig into the molecule, the genes, and uh, how the genes are used, is really new at that time. So <coughs> I was so impressed. <coughs> 
So I decided I'm going to go into this field, but in order to do that, I have to be trained in, in this field. Fortunately, <coughs> one of my uh, professors, um, here uh, is a man, uh, his name is uh, uh, Takashi Yura, uh, <coughs> was a graduate student of uh, David Bonner uh, at U Univers Yale University. <coughs> and uh, he uh, suggested uh, me to uh, uh, enter this uh, new, entirely new graduate program that the Bonner was trying to establish at UC, UC, uh, UCSD in La Jolla. And fortunately, uh, David uh, took me as one of the first graduate students. And uh, I uh, flew over here. Uh, by the way, I just want to give you a little background. This is 1963. At that time, um, you know, the traveling of a Japanese citizen to abroad was highly restricted by the government because the Japan didn't have uh, uh, dollars to be used abroad. Very, didn't have very much of it. So for the graduate student to uh, have, uh, you know, the, uh, to do the uh, their training abroad was very rare, and uh, Takashi Yura is one of them. But uh, uh, I had this great opportunity, great uh, luck to be able to be accepted by this department. And uh, uh, here's the picture of David Bonner. I could not find uh, his picture, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, <coughs> but. Uh, the, the David Bonner at the time, on um, Yale time, and I think it's in the, in the late 50s. You can see that David, uh, see, he, he, he dressed a very uh, spiffy. You see that? <laughs> the leather boots and the leather jacket, and the pipe. Looks wonderful. <laughs> anyway, so a few years later, he decided to start this department in, the, at, at, in La Jolla. Okay. This was called the Department of Biology, but actually the people he collected, he, he hired, was, uh, was in basically in the molecular biology. Okay. So this is one of the first department ever built uh, in the world, ever established in the world, with aiming at the, uh, the, the training and the research of molecular biology. Okay. Um, so when we arrived here, this is a familiar picture of a peer uh, of oceanography. And I show you this picture because there was no building of biology department. Okay? We were renting uh, the spade up uh, building in oceanography, which was right on the, on the beach, on the hill above the beach. And this is the common uh, scene we, we had when I arrived here. And, uh, uh, we had uh, every week, uh, when, I think Wednesday afternoon, uh, we had uh, uh, volleyball. And uh, I was, one of the things I remember is uh, some of the faculty members, even uh, John Singer, who was not uh, very, I mean, maybe he was young, but I don't, he looked older to me. <laughs> At that relatively older. I mean, these uh, fac faculty members, they also joined in the student uh, volleyball uh, matches. And uh, this was uh, um, unbelievable to me, coming from the Japanese, you know, more hierarchical uh, Japanese university system. Okay. Uh, here's another nice shot from the hill above, uh, ab ab above the beach. And uh, we had a great time. Um, I Okay, here's another picture. This is the Masaki Hayashi uh, uh, when he was getting married uh, to Marie Hayashi at the University of Illinois. Again, I could not find an uh, appropriate picture for <laughs> UC <laughs> UCSD time, so I borrowed this from Merrill Mer Green uh, just uh, two days ago. And uh, I worked, uh, I ch ch chose to work with him uh, in his lab. And uh, I had a great training in uh, phage molecular genetics. Okay? And uh, um, this uh, training that I had combined with further training in uh, Renato uh, Darbeckodrab at the Soak Institute as a postdoc. And here the Renato's uh, picture uh, <clears throat> was a really uh, important foundation for my uh, subsequent work in, uh, in immunology 
as well as neuroscience, neurobiology. So I, I just want to emphasize how great uh, training I had, I received uh, while in my uh, uh, years. Uh, now, in I think 19, uh, late 60s, 69, I think, 69, um, you know, I decided to, uh, as I said, I decided to do a postdoc in uh, Renato Dalbeck's lab, and many of you probably know him, um, because I didn't leave, uh, I didn't want to leave La Jolla. It, 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 La Jolla is too wonderful, and uh, why should I go to somewhere else? Uh, so uh, I uh, asked uh, Renato to take me at the, grad, uh, the postdoc, and he accepted me. But the problem was that I came to the U.S. with uh, what is called a Fulbright Fellowship, and uh, which uh, uh, makes you t take a special kind of visa called a J-1 visa, which allow you to stay in the U.S. Uh, only 18 months after you finish, you get a PhD. They call it a practical training. So I knew already that uh, after a short period of postdoc, I had to leave this country. And uh, I didn't particularly want to. I, I mean, all my uh, friends and peers uh, all going up to uh, some getting a job and independent junior faculty position in various different places, mostly in the US. Now, I want to do the same, but uh, I could not do that. And uh, one very close to the uh, day that I was going to be deported by the immigration or naturalization, uh, Dalbeco wrote me a letter, handwritten letter, no email, no fax. Okay? <laughs> handwritten email, uh, the letter, airmail, <laughs> handwritten airmail, uh, on the stationery of a hotel in Rome, okay? saying that something like, uh, I don't know. Uh, Susumu, I don't know what, where you decide to go after you have to leave my lab, but uh, if you have not uh, completely decided, I want to suggest you uh, an alternative. See, this is the way Renato talks to pe uh, his people. Very, very, he's uh, such a gentleman, he doesn't tell you what to do. He suggests something. And uh, he said uh, in that letter um, that, uh, you know, uh, the, the new immunology institute is being established in Basel, Switzerland. And he thinks that someone like me, young uh, person who is trained in hardcore molecular biology, may have a great time if, go, if we want goes into immunology. Okay. That, that the letter said. And I said, he said he, he talked to the director, and uh, if I really, in, if I'm interested in this, I can, I should write to him. And when I received that letter, I thought uh, this is crazy because I knew I knew nothing about immunology. Renato is not an immunologist, really. Uh, I never heard of a city called Basel. <laughs> and uh, I took this letter to downstairs in the Melcon's lab, and I knew someone there. Uh, so I asked him, uh, you know, is there anything a molecular biologist like me can do in the immunology? And his response was, none. <laughs> so I put that letter in my drawer and I didn't respond. And then about uh, three weeks later, Renato came back and it was very unusual that he came to me and said, Susumu, did you write? Did you write to Neil Ziane? He said. So I, th I explained to him, you know, no, I didn't, of course. I, mean, I, I know anything about, I don't know anything about the immunology. And, in, and uh, typically, he made me uh, think more, and uh, he suggested to, to, to think more seriously. And at the end, I, gave, um, I, I decided to take his advice, although I have no idea what I'm going to do in, the, in, 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 in this new institute. And that's how I ended up anyway. I thought I should uh, have a shelter of two years in, in Basel, Switzerland, uh, so, that, and so that I can come back to the US. But this is the institute, uh, uh, small institute, Basel Institute. And, uh, and then here, uh, for the first two years, I didn't do very much. And uh, my contract was only for initially for two years. 
So it was coming to the time when I have to leave. But uh, um, I had a one year extension. And uh, I started, initially I was not uh, really trying to do some research in, uh, with the immunological significance. But uh, as time went by, I, I learned by osmosis about what's going on here. And uh, there was no so-called molecular biology in immunology at that time. Not only in this institute, but anywhere in the world. There was no, no such a thing as a mo molecular immunology or molecular biology in, of the immune system. Okay? But I gradually I learned that there is this problem which has not been resolved for, some people say, 100 years. Uh, the fundamental problem in the immune system, and that is, how we, our immune system, can cope with this enormous diversity of antigens, uh, mostly derived from our pathogens when you are infected, how we uh, deal with uh, uh, the antigen to protect our body. You know, what is, what is the cross, how the antibody molecule which interact with antigen, as you know, <coughs> uh, get diversified in the structure in the, to, to that degree of uh, diversity, okay? And uh, there was a debate, apparently, in the field, uh, quite a bit of a uh, quite heated debate in the conferences. And, uh, some people thought uh, this is all must be all encoded in the genome. There must be, if, if there are one million different antigens that we have to prepare, there must be one million genes, okay? And then uh, some geneticists, including Mel Kong of the Salk Institute, uh, thought this cannot be. There has to be some kind of special mechanism to diversify the uh, in, you know, inherited uh, antibody genes, uh, the mutations and uh, some DNA recombination or something. So there was this debate of germline versus somatic theory of antibody diversity. Okay? So I was exposed to that for the first time. I had never heard of this. And when I had this problem, <coughs> I I thought uh, this can be uh, investigated by the new technology of uh, restriction enzyme, gene cloning, recombinant DNA technology, and all that. Okay? So uh, apparently not really many people thought about it, uh, but uh, uh, I thought uh, I, I, I didn't quite understand why other people are not trying to use this uh, molecular approach uh, to this problem. So I started working on this with uh, one technician, and later two technicians. But uh, uh, so, so this is the, uh, the, the computer graphic of uh, anti typical antibody molecules, uh, you know, Y-shaped structure, heavy chain, and uh, yellow is a light chain. And uh, it was known but uh, by the protein chemistry of antibody molecule, immunoglobulin, that uh, sequence, if you look at the one molecule, one antibody molecule to another mo antibody molecules, that the sequence variation is highly concentrated in the uh, N-terminal region of light and heavy chains, okay? It's called the variable region, and the rest is more constant in terms of the sequence from one molecule to another. Uh, that therefore, they were called the uh, constant region. And uh, so, so here's another, the, uh, this is the X-ray, uh, based on the X-ray studies. And here, here, here the variable region, light chain and heavy chain. Here the, the protein antigen, and the intensicated lysosome. And uh, they, they, they had an the X-ray structure of this, and then they came up with this, uh, confirmed that the variable region is crucial in recognizing and binding to the specific uh, antigen molecules. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, <clears throat> we, I came, we came up, our group came up with uh, this fundamental structure, unusual structure of antibody genes. So when, a, when you receive this antibody uh, gene, a antibody gene from your parent, uh, actually genes, uh, the, the N-terminal region, variable region, and the C-terminal region, uh, constant regions, are not, uh, uh, genes are not contiguous. There are a lot of DNA in between, okay? And then uh, when uh, you, your immune system uh, uh, develop and the B cell matures, uh, some un very unusual thing happened. That is the DNA is, uh, in your lifetime, DNA it get rearranged in the genome, particularly in, in this area of the genome. And then uh, the, uh, the v, v gene and the C gene uh, get very close together, 
Okay, there still was the, this uh, what we later called uh, term the introns, but nevertheless, uh, V region is now uh, uh, joined, but uh, and and, uh, and uh, uh, about thousand base pair uh, uh, five five prime of the C coding region, and then uh, pre mRNA pre mRNA is uh, transcribed from this rearranged gene. Which, is, which exists only in B lymphocytes, not in other type of cells, okay? And then uh, from this uh, way, RNA splicing, which was uh, also found later, that uh, messenger, protein, messenger RNA is made, and then uh, it translated into the protein, okay? So this, this is the basic structure of antibody genes, and what is uh, the reason why this rearrangement helps in diversifying uh, the uh, antibody coding uh, uh, function, it because it turned out in a, for each right chain heavy chain, this case heavy chain, you know, so called V gene, V uh, gene segment, which you inherit from your parents, uh, actually appears in about 300 copies. Okay, each one is slightly different, but indicated by the different uh, patterns. Uh, uh, my uh, assistant, uh, uh, the, the Nady, has uh, generated this beautiful uh, slide for me. And then there's another segment called the D and the J. And these also appear in multiple copies and slightly different from each other. Okay? And in the, on, on the B cell system develop, in each B cell clone, uh, <coughs> there's a ra almost a random combination of the combination between the B segment, D segment, and the J segment and generate all these uh, different, uh, the uh, complete uh, V gene, V genes, okay? So using 320 uh, and the 20D and the 5J segment, uh, in theory, you can get 24,000 uh, different variable region genes. So this all happens in your, as I said, not in a, a, the wrong period of evolution, but in your lifetime in the in a lymph, lymphocyte system. And uh, in addition, it was found that, th so this is the DNA recombination at the molecular level, but there's also another unusual uh, feature of this uh, set of genes, that is uh, uh, point mutations of uh, nucleotide pairs are introduced at a very high rate at some certain stage of B-cell development. So these are the examples of a point mutation found in the early stage of this re research. And uh, it's amazing that how many, uh, the, the, the rate of a mutation uh, that uh, allow these uh, uh, changes in, uh, in the surrounding v, uh, DJ region and it's a surrounding region focused on, on, on only in the other region. In a constant region, that very rarely you can find any mutation. So combining all these recombination, somatic recombination and uh, uh, the muta hyper mutation, in fact, you can generate enormous diversity, and, and also additional mechanism here I know to explain. We can generate more than 10 to 9 uh, different uh, complete genes, uh, immunoglobulin uh, genes, in a single organism, uh, starting with no, no more than uh, 1,000 inherited gene segments. Okay? So this is the essence of this uh, uh, the antibody diversity, somatic diversity of uh, antibodies. And uh, I just want to uh, summarize this uh, finding and using this slide, which is a little bit uh, complicated, but I thought that this is very really interesting because what this study showed, and also subsequent study, and other people have contributed to this, is that uh, what is happening in the immune system, development of immune visceral system, is, is what uh, is the recapturation in a much faster of the what is happening in the evolution of organism on this planet, okay? So we call this Darwinian microcosmos in the immune system, which is based on the diversification of the gene and the selection of the cell, but in this case, in a lifetime, not in a long period of so-called biological evolution, okay? So let's say you start, start with a stem cell, B cell, and then to divide, and they start producing these antibody genes, but each cell express only one kind of uh, antibody, as indicated by these different colors at the cell surface receptor. The antigen comes, you are infected. The antigen comes, 
And the antigen will be screened by the different antibody uh, B cells expressing different antibody uh, proteins on the surface. And if there is a sufficient affinity there, these cells are, this cell is specifically uh, 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 induced to proliferate, to dominate the population and indicated in here. So same cell, or large number of same cells are generated and they the matures and become a so-called plasma cell, which is uh, the factory to make uh, this particular antibody. Okay. So that is what is called uh, primary response. When you are immunized, first week or so, this is, this is what you get. Okay. But the deed antibody is actually affinity to antigen is uh, relatively low because it was not designed to uh, fight with, uh, with, with uh, recognize these antigens. Okay. So, and then the immune reaction will be relatively weak. But if you, during this period, period there's a additional processes going on that the, these cells also uh, uh, divide, and at it, it, as they divide, this hypermutation system is triggered. Okay. So many of the mutant is useless because it's a random mutation and they, they don't get uh, uh, selected by the uh, still floating antigen in, in, in the bloodstream, but the, some of them had a greater affinity, and they are the ones which is selected again. So they are the, uh, this is the, at this stage, it's a diversification uh, by DNA rearrangement and the selection by antigen. And here is a diversification by hypermutation. It's a different genetic mechanism, plus further selection by antigen. And the result of that, this cell uh, will uh, generate a, a plasma cell that will produce uh, very efficiently the high affinity antibody. And that is what is the consequence of a secondary immunization. Okay? So I just wanted to show this to you because uh, I find that this is intriguing. I mean, uh, you know, people argue about uh, biological, really Darwinian evolution is uh, really true or not. Well, I tell you, that Darwinian evolution is going on in your body, okay, in your lifetime, in this immune system. Um, okay, the, the one other thing I want to mention is, uh, you know, remember I started with Jacob Monod's, uh, intrigued by Jacob Monod's work, which was something to do with the gene regulation, okay? And uh, from the very beginning, my, my hidden aim was to try to find a new mechanism for gene regulation, which goes beyond Jacob Monod's operon theory. Okay. I, I mean, this was a very ambitious uh, thing to think about as a 22 years old uh, student, but uh, I just want to let you know that uh, this, in these antibody genes, actually, there is a new mechanism in there, which was also discovered during this process. That is uh, something called the enhancer element, which is not in the five prime uh, promoters uh, that Jacob Monod was de describing. And in case of immunoglobulin gene system, by combination of this uh, uh, enhancer DNA element, which is em embedded in the gene, uh, collaboration between this and the promoter is crucial for the selection of expression of a, the, the rearranged uh, uh, variable region encoding genes. Okay? So, uh, <coughs> This is a very, very brief, brief uh, summary of the work I did. Uh, it took about 10 years to do this, but uh, anyway. So after this, uh, I wanted to come, I mean, I, was, I, I always wanted to come back to the US, okay, because that's where I grew up, I mean, as, as a scientist, as a student. So fortunately, I was invited to MIT, and then uh, uh, I came back after 10 years, uh, came back to MIT, but on, this is on the East Coast this time. And this is a picture of uh, uh, Pikawa Institute for Learning Memory that uh, was uh, established after several years after I arrived. And uh, uh, this is a picture that uh, in, the, in the year that the Red Sox won the World Series after 86 years, ha that year happened to be the year in May that I was invited to uh, give a ceremonial pitch at the Fenway Park. <laughs> I'm very proud of this. <laughs> this uh, young girl is handing the, to me the ball, and I just threw the ball. I don't see the ball here, so it must have been going up here. <laughs> but anyway, I just want to show you that how I've been enjoying the. <laughs> you see the ball? <laughs> <laughs> <One year>. Okay. <laughs> 
I'm also enjoying the, my research, uh, the research time at MIT, and, uh, but there, the, uh, as been said already, after several years, we, I switched to the new field, which is study the memory, and uh, I just want to say, spend a minute or so and uh, explain to you why, why memory, why study memory. Well, because, because memory is uh, intriguing, okay? If you are not a memory researcher, you might think the memory is something like, uh, you know, that some uh, impressive uh, instance you had when you were a child and you can never, you always remember this, like this boy is learning, I guess, how to ride a bicycle from a grandfather or some, somebody like that. Uh, or this is a missing uh, bunch of keys, that's where you think about the memory. But the memory is not just these things. Memory is much more profound than this. Actually, memory is the only way through which you can connect yourself to the rest of the world, including the rest of the people, okay? You, you have a certain uh, personality. Uh, everybody has a personality. You have, everybody has a personal history of uh, life. This is all due to, due to, or I shouldn't say all, mostly due to, the uh, accumulation of the specific set of memory you accumulated in your this brain network. Okay? If you don't have a good memory system, um, then uh, you have very sad situation, uh, the, w w w like, which is manifested by the advanced, uh, for instance, Al Alzheimer patient. And uh, some of these patients, probably in the earlier, earlier stage, may ask the family members, you know, would you, would you please uh, remind me who, 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 who was I, who, who I am? So this suggests that these people have lost their self-identity. You know, they don't know who, who, who they are. Okay. So anyway, you can see from this, the memory is a very crucial among, among even many cognitive functions, and uh, you know, the, the memory is particularly important uh, for uh, higher uh, organisms. Uh, I mean, even lower organisms had the memory for, sub for the purpose of usually for survival. Um, so question is, how do you store information? Memory is basically the information that is stored, extracted from uh, environment, uh, often with uh, experience, and uh, you know, store it, store it in this brain network. So, so how do you store information in, in, in a cell, not cell network? And uh, this is Donald Hebb, is a pioneer, real pioneer, Canadian psychologist, uh, 19, uh, 90, uh, 1940, I think, 40, he published a book uh, in which he suggested uh, the idea of how memory can be stored in the brain network. And his idea is that uh, you know, this is supposed to be uh, some kind of a simple uh, brain network, each dot indicating neurons, and the line to indicate the axons, you know, the uh, nerve, 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 uh, nerve fibers making a connection, which is called the synapses. So in the red area, uh, it's meant to uh, represent a sub-region of a network where the specific memory is stored, okay? So it's multiple cells involved, multiple synapses involved. Memory is not a single cell phenomena or a single uh, synapse phenomena. And also, uh, the, uh, Donald Hebb said uh, that in those, those synapses involved in the memory storage, memory uh, information storage, it's different from the one which have not stored some specific memory. What, in what way they are different? Uh, well, the electric signal through the neurons, through the synapses, uh, uh, go, go, uh, is more efficient in those synapses. Okay. And then that's efficient state, efficient transmission state, uh, can sometimes called LTP, long-term potentiation, can last for some period of time. Okay. And then there are a bunch of cells involved in uh, there, and they connect each other, and the synapses are uh, they, 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 uh, they altered in terms of efficiency of uh, uh, synaptic signal uh, transmission. That, that's a broad idea of HEBS about how the memory can be stored. And uh, this uh, data is uh, from uh, Brisson Lemo in 1970, I think, 73, the, uh, demonstrating that uh, such a synaptic changes, efficacy changes can take, can occur. Now, we've been working with the mouse hippocampus uh, as a model for studying a memory. 
And uh, the, uh, we use this, what, is, what I call intervention studies. That is, that uh, uh, the brain, uh, brain is the most complex uh, machine, machine ever assembled on this planet, okay? It's so complex. That's why uh, neuroscience is more, you know, other, compared to other fields of uh, science, it's, uh, it's very exciting, but there are so much, to, so much more to be, to be done. And, uh, you know, the brain is, uh, uh, one of the features of the uh, brain is that, uh, or central nervous system, is that uh, it comes with many multi layers of complexity, from molecules to uh, cell specialization to single cell action potential, and cell-cell interaction, the cell brain system, the system, system interaction, and the whole animal. Okay, so you, if we want to understand what is going on when you memorize something or you recall something, uh, you want to understand what is going on in the brain, you have to be able to identify every, all processes and events that is going on there at these different level of complexity. And you have to connect them in, in, in terms of con, uh, the cause-consequence relationship. Okay. So how do you do this? Well, it was been done using this uh, the intervention method studies using these chemical, physical regions, or often the biological, pharmacological brocade system. But uh, these systems are useful. It's been very useful to provide uh, us provided us a lot of information. But when it comes to the many more specific questions, subtle, subtle and uh, important questions. Uh, in general, this method is not, specificity is not good enough. Okay? So many years ago, about 15 years ago now, we started to take advantage of the genetic manipulation, which can give much more precise uh, uh, intervention uh, methods, uh, and then use that as a way to uh, 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 address some of the uh, more, more specific, sophisticated questions. But this is what we've been doing. In order to do that, you have to use this molecular biology technology and uh, something called the clear rock speed recombination system. And I will not go into the detail, but this method basically allow uh, <coughs> you to uh, create, uh, for instance, a mouse uh, strain in which a specific gene uh, uh, can be modified or deleted in a specific type of the specific type of the cell in the brain network. Okay. Also, one can have a temporal regulation, temporal control of the gene function, of a specific gene function in a specific area of the brain uh, as the experiment uh, manipulate, manipulate uh, the, uh, the, the conditions. So uh, the first thing we did is to uh, test the Hebb's idea. The Hebb's idea is a, sound extremely inter interesting, okay, sound good. But no, no real experimental evidence. It was very uh, the indirect experimental evidence existed when before, before we started working on this subject. So uh, we uh, decided to use this uh, genetic intervention method and apply this to the hippocampus. Now, why hippocampus? Because the hippocampus is known by, by early region studies and so on. It's crucial for one of the most common form of memory that we, uh, we we form every day. That is the memory of episode events. You know, you had a dinner last night. You went to a vacation uh, to Caribbean island uh, this summer. Da, 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 da. You form all this memory of what you did, what happened. Okay, and uh, in order to form those memory, uh, hippocampus is crucial. If you don't have a hippocampus, uh, then uh, you can't form these memories. So uh, we focus on the hippocampus circuit, and we also focus on the gene, which is known to play a crucial role in uh, LTP induction, okay? And it's called the NMDA receptor gene. And we knocked out the NMDA receptor gene only in the output of a hippocampal circuit called the CA1, which is shown in here. This technology allows that. Uh, you know, this is the entire brain, uh, what is called the sagittal section. And this slide indicates that in, with our technology, only the one type of cells in the hippocampus called the CA1 pyramidal cells, the gene can be knocked out, okay? And uh, ev keeping everywhere else uh, normal. And if you take those animals and then uh, uh, they, they grow, let, let them grow, and then they take a brain slice, kill them, the brain slices, and look at the LTP inducibility, uh, you can see here, compared to the control animal, which is shown in here, this one here, 
uh, LTP is induced, in other words, synaptic efficacy is, uh, you know, this is the baseline and it jump up if you stimulate and it stays there at least for six, 60 minutes in this, in this experiment. But in the mutant, uh, you can't induce LTP. Okay? So question is, is the synaptic plasticity, LTP, in one type of synapses in the hippocampus called the supercollateral CM1 synapses, is that really crucial? for the hippocampus dependent uh, learning uh, capability. And you know, for, for, to test the memory, uh, uh, you know, in a human, if you do the human, they will tell you, I will remember this, and then I, you can demonstrate by language uh, that you, you have a memory. But in an animal, they don't talk to me. So you have to rely on the, in, uh, the in, indirect measurement of the memory existence of memory. So you use this behavior, you put this is a swimming pool, and uh, filled with actually uh, the opaque liquid, the milk-like liquid. And uh, there's a little uh, platform here, plastic platform, submerged just below the surface, and you let animal swim here, mouse swim here. And uh, mouse can swim, not like a human being. You don't need a pre-training. They can swim, but they don't like to be in the water, so they try to get out but they can't, uh, so they run into this platform, and uh, uh, they are very relieved uh, to find the platform. They climb up and take a rest. Now, if you repeat this with the same animal, even using in a different starting point, randomly, or, uh, they eventually, sooner or later, they start swimming to the recursion hidden platform almost directly. Okay. The reason is because they can map the position of a hidden platform relative to the cues surrounding. Uh, do I have the? Yeah, right here. Right here. Okay. So this uh, pool is surrounded with a cylindrical black curtain, but on the four side, illuminated patterns are deliberately displayed. Okay. So they use these uh, patterns to locate the, uh, the, uh, the hidden platform. And once they learn, they form that memory, which is called the spatial memory, memory about the feature of a particular space, uh, they can swim there to directly. Okay? So you use this as a test, and you test this with a control animal, and you test this with a mutant animal to see whether this mutant had problem in acquiring this uh, spatial memory. And uh, this is, uh, so I, I have only one movie here, uh, and uh, I'll show you. This animal is a standard animal, standard mouse, which had been trained a week already. So he knows exactly where the platform is. So now we, te we, we test by putting animal in here. And uh, they went into the water here now. He turned around once, but uh, you know, coming down here. And there's the platform here. So they go like this. This is just a typical one example, OK? So you, do the, you have to do with the multiple animal, the multiple trial, and all that. Uh, but, so, so, but just demonstrate that the normal animal can had the memory, can form a memory. And here the mutant, uh, again, and, uh, in which any receptor is gone from one type of cell in the entire, entire brain. And uh, you can see here, they are run, going around. And uh, the problem with showing this uh, movie is it takes a long time because they can't find the platform. <laughs> But so I showed the one eventually he, he, he happened to find. And uh, he's going around here, and the platform is here, but uh, you know, happened to be coming down, but he misses it because he doesn't have a good memory here. I mean, he's not, <laughs> memory not driving his behavior here. It happened to uh, come here, okay? So this is the way uh, you can uh, test, uh, it is one way to test the memory of the mutant. And this way you can link uh, the deficit, very specific deficit, a particular gene in a particular type of cell which involved in a synaptic plasticity. Uh, if, you, uh, if the animal don't have that, even if everything else, everything else is supposed to be normal, they have a very specific problem in acquiring memory. So uh, this is support. The, the, it's a very strong, strong support for the Hibbs hypothesis. Now, I want to spend the next 10 minutes uh, by giving you a little bit more sophisticated uh, uh, the, the data. And uh, this is meant to be a little bit more for specialists. And uh, the, the, so episodic memory, the memory of episodes, it comes with many, uh, th think about uh, some episode, like uh, dinner last night. You had a nice dinner last night, OK? Now, because I told you that, you are recording last night dinner, right at this moment. 
And uh, you can see this, the, the, this type of memory is acquired. The acquisition is very fast. You know, it doesn't take more than uh, 30 minutes or 40 minutes of dinner. Uh, one trial or one experience acquisition. You don't practice to, to form a last night dinner memory. You have just one dinner last night, and there, there's some feature of that dinner that you, rem you, 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 you form a memory for. And there's a temporal and a spatial association of a diverse set of information. So you had a dinner in a, this place, you know, the, your home, dining room, or maybe restaurant, uh, and uh, it was around this time of the day, da, 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 da. So there are all the temporal, spatial, and the sequence of events is also part of, part of the, uh, the episodic memory. And then I want to talk about the third and fourth thing. And it is called the pattern completion by scientists. What is pattern completion? Pattern completion is retrieval of entire memory, or almost entire memory, with a partial information as the recall cues. Okay? So I go back to the dinner memory. So you had a dinner, and the dinner had a lot of content. Uh, last night dinner, let's say, rich content, specific to that dinner. And I have no idea what kind of dinner you had, but I told you you had a dinner. And therefore, you will use that, my, my, my uh, remark, as a recall cue to activate your last night of dinner memory. And a lot of things are in there that you are now recalling. Okay? So using very limited, relevant uh, information uh, as a cue that you can activate entire memory. Uh, so that is called pattern completion. This is typical in uh, episodic memory, very pronounced in episodic memory. And then there's another one called the pattern separation. This is sort of opposite of a pattern completion, and that is encoding of similar episodes into a separate memory. So you have a different dinners yesterday, two days ago, and uh, uh, so, so you may be able to distinguish these two, two dinner memories uh, because you had a dinner with a different person and all that. So we are very good at this, although sometimes we fail and that is be able to uh, form very uh, distinct memories for very similar, similar events. Okay? So that's called the pattern completion, and the pattern separation, I meant. And so I, our hypothesis has been, and some uh, of the uh, pioneering uh, model builders, uh, computational neuroscientists, hypothesis has been that in the hippocampus, for instance, all these circuits of different type of cells here, I, I mentioned about CA1 here, CA3 in a different type, uh, the, the, the different circuits are playing crucial role, more primary role in uh, these phenomena, like a pattern separation and pattern completion. Okay? But uh, we want to test though, the idea in which circuit, which subregion of the hippocampus is really crucial for uh, separation and completion. So uh, the it turned out that uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, competition people thought CS3 is very important because the CS3 send ax CS3 cells send axons to uh, uh, another type of CS3 cells, okay, not just to feed the forward network, uh, but a pathway, but it, uh, it's called the recurrent pathway. In addition to the feed forward pathway from CS3, CS3 to CA1. Okay. So the uh, idea is that the plastic uh, the current network may help to uh, associate many uh, things that happened during the dinner. And, and then uh, if you uh, and the recall time comes and somebody tells you something about the last night dinner, then uh, that's enough to uh, uh, activate all the things that happened. Uh, that, that was the information stored in this uh, current network. That's the idea. Okay. So we want to test this idea by experiment. And again, we use this more, uh, the water maze. And uh, uh, the, this is a different mutant. And you, after animal have been trained in the water maze, you, you test the memory, like, like I showed you with the picture, uh, with the movie. So this is the, the uh, you, you divide the surface of the, uh, the, uh, the pool uh, arbitrarily into four uh, uh, equal quadrants, okay? And if animal had a good memory of the location of the platform, they will spend more time uh, searching, searching that uh, that quadrant as opposed to uh, other quadrant. By the way, in this, when you do this test, you re actually uh, the right before you uh, the, the, the your graduate student go there and remove the platform without telling the mice that the platform was removed. And uh, therefore, animal thinks that there uh, there is a memory, uh, there is a platform. Okay, so they spend a lot of time searching in the, the quadrant target quadrant, 
but not very much in the other quadrant. So that this indicates the memory is there. And the mutant, uh, in, in this case, this is a different mutant. NMD receptor is now knocked out only in the CA3 pyramidal cell. And then uh, they also do that same. I mean, there are no difference, statistically, no difference between them. Okay? So CA3 NMD receptor is not needed in order to recall, for the animal to recall the memory. Okay? However, the next day, uh, you do one more test, in which case, three out of four major cues surrounding the pool is removed. So there's only one cue. In other words, recall cue is very limited in this case. Okay? Like the way I said, you had the dinner last night, and you recall the entire dinner memory. So you're yeah, given a very limited cue, and then control animals still uh, indicate, showed their memory, existence of memory, with a very limited cue, but the mutant animal's memory recall is greatly compromised. So this is uh, uh, evidence uh, supporting the idea that the recurrent plastic recurrent network in a CS3 is crucial for the for uh, pattern completion based uh, memory recall. The one other thing I want to mention is uh, uh, this the thing called the pattern separation. Okay, this is a very recent work, and uh, in fact uh, some of this uh, thing I will tell you is not even published. But anyway, the idea here is that uh, the, this circuit here. Not C3, but the circuit here is important. Then it's called the dentate gyrus uh, for, for this purpose. And uh, so we have recently uh, ad addressed this question. And I just want to tell you without going, giving you real evidence. And uh, by the way, this is the, uh, the subject, also the, uh, the uh, rusty gauge who is somewhere around here, over there, uh, had also made a very recently very important discovery on this subject. And uh, I'm combining his discovery with ours. Uh, and uh, you know, it turned out that uh, you know, in the most of the part of the brain, once cells are made, neurons are formed, during, mostly during embryonic time, or during the peri birth time, they don't divide anymore. Not like uh, lymphocytes, where they keep dividing. Okay? So once they, they are formed, uh, then uh, they, 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 you, you have to live with them. Okay? But except in the two places, the one is uh, hippocampus dentate gyrus that I mentioned, and the other is the olfactory system. But in, strangely, in the dentate gyrus area, uh, the cell keep dividing in, in, the, in this area here. Okay? So it's been a long uh, enigma of what this, uh, uh, what this uh, continuous genogenesis uh, uh, going on in the dentate gyrus, what, 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 do, what is their purpose? Okay? So recently, uh, using, uh, focusing on the technique that allow you to study only the function of uh, the uh, adult-generated granular cell, adult-generated dentate gyrus granular cells, the rusted group has shown that this part, these cells are very important for uh, pattern separation. Okay. Amazing thing is that this is no more than 5% of the cell in the dentate gyrus. It's a very small fraction of them. But they are very active cells. And uh, if you uh, kill them, uh, this, cell have a, this animal has a problem in the separating similar, similar patterns. So separation is a problem. Um, also, uh, we have shown that uh, the, uh, if, you, uh, knock out those, uh, if you knock out those major granular cells, they are fine. They have no problem in uh, distinguishing uh, patterns. Discriminating different patterns. Okay. So, uh, and on, on the other hand, those animals that we have, in which majority of granular cells, uh, uh, the transmission to the downstream is blocked, these cells had the problem in pattern completion that I mentioned earlier. So, completion and separation are apparently like in a shiso. Uh, it, it, it is a young granular cell, other generated. And this is the, uh, the, uh, the, this is the embryo derived majority of uh, all the granular cells. So apparently they, they are in this particular very intricate balance in a normal, uh, let's say normal physiological situation. But when a young granular cells uh, more become more functional, not necessarily more cells, but uh, more, more functional, then, uh, then the pattern separation is promoted. On the other hand, if the pattern, uh, the uh, old cells uh, become more dominant, uh, like by, by, by this genetic manipulation, then the pattern completion uh, becomes more dominant. Okay? 
So these two phenomena are parallelly competing. Uh, the, the, the two types of granular cells, old and young, are competing uh, in order to uh, keep the uh, level of separation and completion at the proper level. And I think I'm done with it. And uh, let's see. Uh, I just want to finish with a few slides by philosophizing a little bit for the future of neuroscience. And uh, this is, uh, I just wrote it down here, the, the fu major function of the brain. And on the left side in English, this is uh, Chinese characters, but it's also in Japanese. And I can see the percept recognition of perception, uh, memory I mentioned, uh, emotion I didn't say anything about, consciousness, attention, thought, Imagination, creativity, abstraction, language, personal form personality formation, the motor control, all of these things, are the brain, brain uh, central nervous system playing a crucial role, okay? And uh, some of these things are very difficult to, uh, to, to approach, such as uh, uh, brain mechanisms for creativity. You know, the, the, the people that are mathematicians, uh, there's a tremendous uh, kind of abstraction uh, which uh, we don't understand how they do it, how what is happening in the brain. Uh, language is a very difficult uh, issue to study, uh, although we all know that the brain plays a crucial role. And it's difficult because the animals don't speak, don't have the languages. So you can't use the animal models and, and the song. And uh, so, you know, the, the, this man uh, with the, the Descartes, the 17th century French giant philosopher, he says, uh, this kind of uh, uh, mind problem cannot be studied by physical science method, like physics, chemistry, or modern day biology. So this is a position of dualism. Okay? And, and he says, he's a philosopher, he says, uh, uh, this, uh, the mind, uh, high level mind problem can be all, only uh, uh, investigated by, by, by thinking like him, but uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't, we don't agree with this, okay? And uh, many neuroscientists, well, some may agree with this, but uh, many don't, and a typical uh, champion uh, expressed this position, opposite position, is uh, Francis Crick, in his uh, book called The Astonishing Hypothesis, and uh, here, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and the free will are, in fact, no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Okay. So this is the position we take. I believe in this. And uh, uh, many of these uh, issues that I listed here, uh, uh, eventually, I think it, it, it will be understood. Okay. So that's uh, uh, my uh, prediction for the future. And uh, it can be wrong, but uh, that's what I think. And I end, end, end by uh, giving you this slide. Of, uh, this is a very personal thing. But uh, since the organizer put a subtitle to my talk, uh, which is uh, my journey uh, in, uh, in research or something, I, I, put, I made this slide. <laughs> So I, I studied the materials, studying materials uh, in the chemistry at the Kyoto, and then I got interested in the molecular biology. That way I started uh, working on uh, life, I guess. And then uh, in the San Diego, partially, and in Bado, and going into the immunology, and eventually now I'm coming from material life to the mind, uh, and, and uh, I guess in the neuroscience in the Boston. So uh, let's see, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, only, so please pay attention to this, uh, oh no, I can't find, yeah, this is the abridged list, okay? I can't list everybody, it's impossible. So in the Kyoto time, I, uh, I, I owe my uh, career very much to the, this Professor Yura, who introduced me to uh, David Bonner, and Itaru Watanabe also, and UCSD, I had a great uh, training from uh, Masaki Hayashi, Mel Green, with whom I did the first year first one year of uh, uh, the uh, thesis work, and also, uh, of course, David Bonner. And uh, at the Soak Institute, I owe a lot uh, to Renato D'Alberco. Without his advice, my career would have been completely different. And uh, Vado, uh, Nils Yane was the director, but then, uh, I hope some of you know this name here, Charles Steinberg. 
Anybody know this name? Yes, great, great. <laughs> People who know him uh, often say, says he's the second uh, uh, genius, second most genius on this planet. The first one is the Feynman. But, uh, he's the second. But he's the great geneticist who, uh, uh, who uh, uh, introduced the problem, uh, you know, in the battle, this, uh, uh, the, uh, immuno, the antibody diversity uh, issues, and uh, became a very close friend of mine, but he's deceased uh, early, uh, like David did. And MIT, Salvador Luria, uh, they invited me to go to MIT. These are the few people that play the role in the specific work I described, CA1, CA3, and then the JRS. And I think they will uh, uh, forgive me if I don't mention each, each person here. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>